The constitutional rights, and in particular, um, its longtime leader, departed leader Michael Ratner, have been involved in efforts to curtail US, the U.S. role in Iraq for decades, going back to the 1980s uh, when the U.S. was bombing Iraq for a variety of, of made-up reasons and at the same time at home trying to justify them uh, by misdeeds that were happening abroad, all the while positioning itself um, in terms of trying to get access to and control of Iraqi oil, positioning itself uh, with respect to the then Soviet Union and the battles that were going on in the region. Uh, CCR has been very actively involved, and we've been involved primarily as a legal organization, and the value is looking at the political context which we all share as people that care about um, humanity and care about what happens to folks, um, but also looking at the rules that have been broken, the lies that have been told, um, the bill of goods that have been sold to the American people in order to justify um, really what is essentially aggressive war without end. George Bush uh, took the position that he could invade uh, or bomb or do any type of action against Iraq that he wanted. But he was famous for a quote that said that he didn't need to go to some old goat in Congress to ask permission to get uh, Saddam Hussein out of, out of Kuwait. And I think what's interesting about that is what he was referring to was the 1973 uh, War Powers Resolution that required uh, that the president get um, the Congress to be able to declare war as opposed to being able to take these types of war actions um, by him by itself. There's a long history in the United States of people using courts as a place, as a almost like a town center where uh, the questions of morality, of humanity, and law come together. And so even when the government and the president is moving forward in ways that are illegal and unconstitutional, um, it's our duty and our obligation to raise that in the streets, to raise that um, in our legislative bodies, but also to raise it in the courts. And that's what uh, we were trying to do. After 9-11, <clears throat> uh, we, of course, continued that fight, but things began to shift a little bit because we also began to find, particularly in Iraq, um, that the U.S. government, um, because it was so unpopular to be sending troops to Iraq, that the U.S. government was employing private, private military contractors to do some of the dirty work in Iraq. Uh, which, pre which presented an interesting problem. And what, the way that I think about this and the way that we thought about it here at the center was, this is essentially corporate complicity in human rights violations um, by the executive branch and by the United States government. So uh, we've, always been, we've always known that there has been a, um, a, a economic incentive that moves forward military actions, but this is one of the first times that we've seen an economic incentive for corporations to actually participate uh, on the ground in those types of things. So um, we've, we filed a number of lawsuits. A couple of them I want to mention because I think they're important for the Obama administration and moving forward. Uh, one of them was a case against the military contractor called Blackwater. And we filed two cases there. Eric Prince, um, who was the founder of Blackwater and whose sister incident, incidentally um, is being considered for a cabinet position under the Trump administration, interestingly enough. Uh, but Eric Prince um, and these private military contractors were making billions of dollars off the Iraq war and they were contracted with the Secretary of State to provide security. Um, in Nisur Square in Iraq, um, there was a confrontation where they essentially shot up, I believe it was 20 shot and killed 17 or 22 people um, as military contractors, not held accountable whatsoever by the U.S. government. Um, the Iraqi government had no power over them, and so it kind of fell to civil society to do something about it. So we filed a series of lawsuits against uh, the Blackwater Corporation. Those lawsuits were settled um, and that the families of the people, the families of the people who were killed uh, did get financial settlements out of those cases. But again, we were not successful in the larger question, which was really trying to limit severely the use of military contractors. Um, the, one of the theories being that the U.S. can't afford to do the type of wars that it wants to do without 
either our permission and when they don't have our permission, they subtract, sub, subcontract out a lot of those functions. So many of our of the people that were over in Iraq and Afghanistan were private military contractors. It was really kind of astounding. Um, the other case I want to bring up is a case that's actually um, still being argued right now. It's a case called um, Al Shamari versus uh, Kaki, C A C I, which is a California California based corporation. Um, and this happened after 2002, after the invasion, and people were then swept up and put into these military hard sites. One of them being Abu Ghraib. Um, these private military contractors were contracted to do interrogations um, and to do interviews of these clients, but they participated and moved forward in torture. So the lawsuit against them is challenging these corporations for torturing at the behest of um, and in conjunction with uh, Bush policy in Abu Ghraib. That, one, there were two cases. One of them actually settled in. It is the only case on record where uh, people were tortured post 9-11 where uh, they got a financial settlement. This is one of the good success stories in the context of Iraq and torture, certainly. And the other one is actually still moving forward. Um, it's been bouncing back and forth through the courts. Uh, but most recently, just several weeks ago, we got a ruling uh, from the Court of Appeals uh, down in Virginia, where the Khaki Corporation was saying that they shouldn't be held liable um, for acts that essentially the government was contracting with them to do. Um, the Fourth Circuit um, really taking on this question of presidential authority essentially said that um, presidential authority to do the things like torture, um, there's, no, there's no circumstance in which a president can authorize something like that. And that's a distinctly post 9-11 um, ruling. Uh, for the past 15 years, we haven't heard much about things like that, but we're beginning to see those things now. And so what I think that brings us to in terms of the current administration or the Obama administration and the Trump administration is number one, um, the Trump, the, the Obama administration um, has to do what it can to lock down the question of accountability. We've been after the Obama administration for since the first day in office to hold uh, members of its own administration and Bush administration figures accountable for torture, for abuse, for war making, for crimes against humanity. Um, understandably, that's not something that any president is going to roll over and do. It does present an opportunity now as we move into what I think is a much more dangerous era, uh, one in which whatever you think about President Obama, um, at least he thinks about some of these issues, even if he doesn't act. Um, I think we're having a president now that's going to act without thinking. And so really what we're, what we're facing, I think, in the next era is going back to some of these questions and having courts readdress the issue of whether the rules that have been put in place in Congress, the rules that we abide by um, in the United Nations, should be applied to um, reduce and to cabin in the presidential power from this particular president um, in this country that really is uh, still um, deploying its resources to be able to have strategic positioning over natural resources. Very important for us to continue to push for accountability for all of the people that committed these crimes, that committed crimes in our name, that were contravening international and domestic law. Um, that's where we need to be putting our efforts over the next four years.